Coming up... This is what the tragedy is. The origins of a global conflict. They were put as a burden on the international community. We'll take you back to 1948. Advancing Arab armies can just kill the Jews and drive them into the sea. To see the first Palestinian refugees. They wanted to keep them as pawns, as a tool against Israel. Hear the real truth behind this crisis. They were shortchanging their own people. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. There was a remarkable change of tone at last night's Republican presidential debate. Instead of personal attacks and insults, this time the candidates were actually polite. But even though they were nicer to each other, they still clearly had their differences on everything from the economy to Israel to Islam. David Brody brings us the story from Miami. A strange sight and sound in South Florida. I cannot believe how civil it's been up here. Donald Trump set the tone for the evening. One of the biggest political events anywhere in the world is happening right now with the Republican Party. Millions and millions of people are going out to the polls and they're voting. The Republican establishment, or whatever you want to call it, should embrace what's happening. Even with this kinder, gentler approach, attention focused on the front runner when it came to policy differences. And I want to leave Social Security as is. I want to make our country rich again so we can afford it. Anyone who tells you that Social Security can stay the way it is, is lying. On trade, Ted Cruz took issue with Trump's threat to How level a 45% tax on the Chinese, believing that they would just pass it on to American consumers. How does it help you to have a president come and say, I'm going to jack, I'm going to put a 45% tax on diapers when you buy diapers, on automobiles when you buy automobiles, on clothing when you buy clothing. That hurts you. Honestly, it's just the opposite. What will happen if they don't behave? We will put on a tax of some amount, and it could be a large amount, and we will start building those factories and those plants. Instead of in China, we'll build them here, and people will buy product from here rather than buying it through China, where we're being ripped off. The candidates also disagreed on pursuing peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Trump has received criticism for saying that he'd be neutral in negotiations. I don't think we need a commander in chief who is neutral between the Palestinian Thank terrorist you. and one of our strongest allies in the world, the nation of Israel. I'm a negotiator. If I go in, I'll say I'm pro Israel and I've told that to everybody and anybody that would li listen. But I would like to at least have the other side think I'm somewhat neutral as to them so that we can maybe get a deal done. There is no peace deal possible with the Palestinians at this moment. There just isn't. I don't believe there is any long-term permanent peace solution, and I think pursuing that's the wrong thing to do. Trump also had to defend his recent comments that he thinks Islam hates America. Did you mean all 1.6 billion Muslims? I mean a lot of them. I mean a lot of them. I know that a lot of people find appeal in the things Donald says because he says what people wish they could say. The problem is presidents can't just say anything they want. It has consequences here and around the world. I don't want to be so politically correct. I like to solve problems. The question of a contested convention also came up in case no one secures enough delegates to win the nomination outright. You have to earn the delegates in order to be picked, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. First of all, I think I'm going to have the delegates, okay? I think. Let's see what happens. Cruz tried to use the moment to tout his success against Trump. We have at this point beaten Donald in eight separate states all over the country. But I beat him in 13 contests. He never mentions that. What Cruz does mention is his belief that Trump's voters are not very well informed. Those remarks to CBN News led to major headlines across the country. Listen, Donald does well with voters who have relatively low information, who are not that engaged and who are angry and they see him as an angry voice. After the debate, Trump pushed back. My vote is a very, very high end and smart. Uh, and we really cover every spectrum. The question going forward is, will there be a home field advantage when voters go to the polls next Tuesday? In other words, will Marco Rubio win here in Florida and will John Kasich win in Ohio? If both lose and Trump wins, well then Ted Cruz will finally get that one-on-one -on -one matchup he's been wanting for some time, but will it be too late? David Brody, CBN News, on South Beach in Miami, Florida.
Well, isn't democracy wonderful? We've had such a wonderful campaign so far. Uh, please don't make it a spectator sport. It, it has a tendency to turn into that. Please don't. Please vote if, you, if, your, if your state has not voted yet. Please make sure you're registered uh, to vote both in the general election and, and take part. Take part in the primaries. Well, Ephraim Graham has the rest of our top stories from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, ISIS is committing genocide against Christians and other religious groups. That is the finding from a report by the Knights of Columbus and another group called In Defense of Christians. The report increases the pressure on the White House to officially call the ISIS actions genocide. The report details how Christians have been killed, kidnapped, raped, and how religious property has been destroyed. Earlier this month, the White House said the legal determination for using the term genocide had not yet been met. But critics say reports like this prove otherwise, and Congress is pushing the State Department and White House to make a decision. We'll have an in-depth report on this serious issue next week here on The 700 Club. Extremely heavy rains have led to flooding in Louisiana. That's forcing thousands of people to evacuate their homes, and forecasters expect more rain to come. Heather Sells has the story. People in northern Louisiana have been getting out while they can. Entire subdivisions are underwater and more rain is expected. The big concern right now, the threat of a levee breach. It's why the governor has ordered a mandatory evacuation for more than 3,000 families. In some areas, more than 20 inches of rain has fallen, triggering rescues by boat and special vehicles designed for high water. Operation Blessing is helping families in northern Louisiana with their damaged homes. Carol Chavez's home took in three feet of water. About five o'clock in the morning, my husband uh, got up. He heard some noises downstairs and went downstairs to check and stepped into a foot of water. The severe weather is not confined to Louisiana. Up to 10 inches of rain has fallen in communities along the Mississippi in states like Tennessee and Arkansas. The rain is also pummeling parts of Texas. It's going to happen. There's not much use in worrying about it because it's just a fact of life. When it rains this much at one time in these areas, it floods. Forecasters say the region can expect more rain through Sunday, but it's expected to be light and scattered, which could help end further flooding and allow homes and properties to begin drying out. Heather Sell, CBN News. You can learn more about what Operation Blessing is doing in this difficult situation and how you can help by going to its website, ob.org. America says farewell to Nancy Reagan today. For the last two days, the public has lined up to pay final respects to the former first lady and wife of President Ronald Reagan at his library in Simi Valley, California. I had um, a lot of respect for the Reagans and for Nancy. This lady meant a lot. I've seen her do wonderful things for the community. Speakers at the service include her children, Ron and Patty Davis. The guest list is full of names reflecting the Reagans' years in Hollywood, along with their time in government, including four of the five last first ladies and family members of every president dating back to John F. Kennedy. CBS LA reports both Nancy and Ronald Reagan stayed involved in the Bel Air Presbyterian Church in California and often gave time, money, and even clothing to help with the poor. There is a new celebrity in the Hindu nation of Nepal. The country was devastated last year by a tragic earthquake. Now, Superbook's Gizmo is helping children to laugh again and enjoy some valuable lessons. Lucille Toulousen brings us that story. Superbook's mascot, Gizmo, has only been in Nepal for three weeks, but he has already reached more than 30,000 children. CBN believes that introducing one of the main characters of the Bible animation series Superbook to churches and schools will increase viewership of the program. The Nepali version of Superbook began airing on national television two weeks before the big earthquake struck in Nepal last year. But with Gizmo and the Superbook team going to the schools, mostly Hindu, in remote villages, its audience is growing bigger. Gizmo is fast gaining new fans here in Nepal. The children love him and they can learn moral values from its Bible stories. Up on stage, Gizmo talked in Nepali language to the children. 
He challenged them to courageously fight their bad habits, just like David was brave enough to fight Goliath. Gizmo's bubbly and funny character delighted the students and school administrators as well. Thank you for bringing Gizmo to our school and introducing Superbook. This will be a big help for our students. Schools in Nepal are mostly Hindu, and this poses a challenge to show Superbook to the students because it is Christian in nature. One principal said, oh, this, this is against our culture and traditions. So our Nepali team leader challenged him, just watch one episode of Superbook and tell me what you think. So he watched it and he saw that these Superbook stories teach the same good morals and the same good character traits that they teach in their schools. And then they were very glad to promote Superbook. These children who met Gizmo in person on a Saturday couldn't wait to get home to watch Superbook, which aired later on that same day. And because only a few homes had television in this remote village in Kanchanpur, this bunch of kids gathered in one hut to watch Superbook for the first time. I am very, very happy to meet Gizmo and watch him in Superbook. I learned from the story today that we should be obedient and respectful to our parents. I really like Superbook very much and we will watch it again. Gizmo's tour has just begun. The Superbook team is going to visit many churches and schools across Nepal especially now that the Association of Private Boarding Schools has approved the Superbook tours in schools. One of our goals is to see children transformed and develop good character. Then when this generation grows up, they can have a positive effect upon the nation. Lucille Telusan, CBN News, Dangadi, Nepal. The smiles on those children's faces says it all, Gordon. That certainly does. If you want to see the stories of the Bible get to the children of the world, how do you do that? Well, you can do it one way, by joining the 700 Club. This is just a part of what we do. We are a lot more than a TV show. We want to reach the world with the good news, with the gospel. If you want to be a part of it, join with us. How much is it? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. So call us now, 1-800-759-0700. Terry? Well, coming up, meet a couple who dreamed of adopting a child and see how the Internet helped make that dream a reality. Adoption can be a long and expensive process, and many couples longing to adopt simply can't afford it. But as Charlene Aaron shows us, the Internet offers solutions to help foot the bill. Randall and Kelly Nichols knew from the time they married that they dreamed of adopting. It's kind of always been. Yeah, I mean, when we were dating, we, well, we, we talked about how one day we wanted to adopt. After several years and three children of their own, the dream still remained. Initially, they planned to adopt a special needs child within the U.S. That all changed when they saw a picture of a little girl in China named Isla. When I saw, they posted her picture and I was, I knew this was, this was our daughter. Bringing Isla home, however, would be a challenge. We did not have money for adoption. We did have enough for right. a domestic adoption and that's why we right. kind of started there. But when we saw the, you know, the cost that it would that would be involved with an international adoption, we just thought, man, there's just no way we can do this. While U.S. adoptions cost up to twenty-six thousand dollars, an international adoption can run from thirty-five to forty thousand dollars. The Nichols tried various ways to raise the funds needed to bring Isla home. We did a number of different things with yard sales, and we made T-shirts and. Um, sold bracelets and, um, you know, begged our friends. When praying about how to proceed, the Nichols turned to the popular crowdfunding site, GoFundMe. Hi, we're the Nichols family, and this is our adoption story. We had to trust God for every dollar, no matter, you know, what the dollar amount, and we knew that we couldn't do it alone. GoFundMe allows people to contribute online to causes they believe in. There have been more than 3,000 adoption-related fundraisers in the last four years, 
raising more than $6 million. Their campaign started off slow, then began to pick up momentum. Friends, family, and even strangers contributed more than $40,000 toward their adoption effort, something both Randall and Kelly found very humbling. What we saw was there were some people who gave multiple times. Right. Were, Sacrificially, too. Yeah. Not like, this is extra money that I can give. Like, we're going to go without something to give you. Like, single mom mm -hmm. taking care of her mom and daughter, giving us, you know, $500 mm -hmm. every time we turned around. After an 18-month journey, the time finally arrived to meet their little girl face to face. She reached for me. I wanted her to come to us when she was ready, and she reached for me. I couldn't stop crying, you know, and it was kind of hard to, like, just be in the moment without, you know, feeling a little bit out of control. At their homecoming, supporters greeted them with love and fanfare, many calling Isla a celebrity. There were probably um, 20 to 30 people at the airport when we got there, at you know, midnight. at 1130 yeah, at night. Um, signs and everything. Yeah, right? yes. just to celebrate. The Nichols admit raising a child with special needs is challenging. Isla has a heart condition that has led to one open heart surgery, and she's set to undergo another procedure soon. Still, her parents say that all pales in comparison to having her as part of their family. It's hard to think of them because the, the joy that she has brought us is so far outweigh the challenges. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Adoption, it's a God idea, and it's such a great picture of our relationship with our Heavenly Father who's given us His name, given us a home with Him forever, and provided all that we need to live in victory. If you have a heart for adoption, there are lots of ways for you to find out more about that. Many wonderful, solid adoption agencies in the United States. You know, the opening of countries kind of comes and goes, so you need to be sure if you're looking internationally what's available, but lots of children in the foster care system here in America needing moms and dads. So if God's laid that on your heart, check it out. Check it out. Gordon? Well, up next, more than five million people are registered as Palestinian refugees, and their numbers keep growing. They wanted to keep them as pawns, as a tool against Israel, educating their children to hate Israel, to look at Israel and the Jews as those who created this quote-unquote injustice. Hear the facts about these refugees and find out why their fellow Arabs won't help them up after this. In 1967, the UN Security Council passed a resolution calling for a just solution to the Palestinian refugee problem. Well, it's been almost 70 years since Israel declared statehood, so you might ask, why are there still Palestinian refugees after all this time? And why are their numbers growing? Take a look. When the Jewish people declared independence in 1948, they offered their Arab neighbors an olive branch. We appeal, in the very midst of the onslaught launched against us now for months, to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship. About a tenth of Palestine's Arabs took them up on their offer. The rest declared war. The 160,000 Palestinian Arabs that chose to stay with their neighbors, the Palestinian Jews of 1948, they became full citizens of the reborn state of Israel the 160,000 now became 1.2 million. They have full rights, equal opportunities, and today you would see them in the Knesset as members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, in the Supreme Court, and anywhere else in the Israeli society. But what happened to the others? The Arabs tell the story of the Palestinian Nakba, or catastrophe in which the Jews expelled hundreds of thousands of Arabs by force. 
But the facts tell a very different story, one that started even before Israel became a state. France, yes. The Arab exodus from Palestine began shortly after the UN's partition vote in 1947. Roughly 30,000 wealthy Arabs were the first to leave, choosing to wait out the war in neighboring countries. Then over the next few months, thousands of others followed suit. One month before the Jews declared independence, British troops evacuated the northern coastal city of Haifa. When the Jewish Haganah took control, the city's Arabs were ordered to flee, but not by the Jews. On the contrary, David Ben-Gurion sent one of his top cabinet members to convince them to stay. Golda Meir described the scene in her memoir. Hundreds drove across the border, but some went to the seashore to wait for boats. Ben-Gurion called me in and said, I want you to go to Haifa at once and see to it that the Arabs who remain there are treated properly. You must get it into their heads that they have nothing to fear. I sat there on the beach and I begged them to return to their homes. I talked myself blue in the face and it didn't help. They only had one answer. We know there is nothing to fear, but we have to go. We'll be back. The British police backed up Golda's account, saying, every effort is being made by the Jews to persuade the Arab populace to stay and carry on with their normal lives and to be assured that their lives and interests will be safe. The city's British commander, Major General Hugh Stockwell, told the departing Arabs, you have made a foolish decision. You must accept the conditions of the Jews. They are fair enough. After all, it was you who began the fighting, and the Jews have won. In the end, more than 50,000 Arabs fled Haifa, turning the thriving port city into a ghost town. So if the British wanted them to stay, and the Jews wanted them to stay, who made the Arabs leave? The Arab populations, many of them, heeded the calls from the Arab leaders to attack their Jewish neighbors or to leave the area, kind of let it be cleared so the conquering, advancing Arab armies can just kill the Jews and drive them into the sea. This is exactly what created the Palestinian refugee problem. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Sayed announced that we will smash the country with our guns and obliterate every place the Jews seek shelter in. The Arabs should conduct their wives and children to safe areas until the fighting has died down. And in his memoir, Syrian Prime Minister Khalid al-Azam wrote that since 1948, we have been demanding the return of the refugees to their homes. But we ourselves are the ones who encourage them to leave. Only a few months separated our call to them to leave and our appeal to the United Nations to resolve on their return. By the time Israel declared statehood, more than 200,000 Arabs had left Palestine. As one refugee told a Jordanian newspaper, the Arab government told us, get out so that we can get in. We got out, but they did not get in. The UN partition plan had given both Jews and Arabs the chance to build their own states in Palestine. But instead of starting a country, the Arabs started a war they didn't win. And the result was even more refugees. In July of 1948, an order from the Israeli army stated that Arab villages were not to be looted or demolished. But as the war progressed, Arabs were expelled from places where they posed security risks, cities like Ramleh and Lod, 
where their forces regularly attacked Jewish convoys. But these cases were the exception, not the rule. And even the commander of Jordan's Arab Legion admitted that villages were frequently abandoned even before they were threatened by the progress of war. This is what has to be understood. The Palestinian refugee problem is first and foremost the responsibility of the Arab Palestinian leaders of the time in 1948, the leaders of the Arab League, and the leaders of the Arab nations who attacked Israel in 1948. By the end of the war in 1949, around 600,000 Arabs had left Palestine. But today, over 5 million people are registered as Palestinian refugees. Why do their numbers keep growing? And why aren't they getting help from their fellow Arabs who encourage them to leave their homes in the first place? The short answer is that they wanted to keep them as pawns, as a tool against Israel. And also, to keep it always as a claim against Israel and as an incitement to educating their children to hate Israel, to look at Israel and the Jews as those who created this quote-unquote injustice to the Palestinians. The refugees should have been absorbed by their fellow Arabs in neighboring countries. At least that was the plan back in 1949, when the UN started the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. But that plan fell apart when the Arab nations refused to take the Palestinians, even though they had been offered international funds to pay for them. Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon insisted they had no room. And when the Egyptians gained control of the Gaza Strip in 1949, they refused to allow Gaza's 200,000 Palestinians to move into Egypt or anywhere else. Lebanon and Saudi Arabia allowed some refugees to enter, but not to become citizens, hold jobs, or own land. The only exception was Jordan, which absorbed more than two million Palestinians. By international law, the refugees that are in any country have to be treated with dignity. They have to get services. They have to get uh, citizenship. This was not the case with the Arab refugees of Palestine or with the Arab countries. They, until today, 66 years later, are kept in subhuman conditions in refugee camps. We are honorable people. We are not looking to impose on anyone or to beg to receive charity. We are not used to this. We are used to working and feeding ourselves from our own labor and the sweat of our brow. I have a kid with special needs. How am I going to get him health care? How will we live in this country if I'm confined to this small camp? Tell me. They were denied uh, citizenship, social security, uh, health care, education, and they were put as a burden on the international community. Also, their children who were already born in these respective countries, whether it was in Lebanon or Syria or any other countries. Also, these children who by law should receive citizenship as they were born in these countries were denied citizenship. The Yarmouk district in Damascus is the largest Palestinian camp in Syria. Today, it's on the front lines of the Syrian civil war. And since 2013, some 45,000 Palestinian refugees have fled to Lebanon, where they're also being confined to camps in subhuman conditions. There's no food, no vegetables, and no bread. If you get food, it's sometimes rotten. There is nothing in this camp. When we arrived here, we were 12 people living in this tent. I still don't have a tent for me and my closest, not even a mattress. This is the third Nakba that we have witnessed. The first time was when we had to leave Palestine. My family and I went to Lebanon, but the people there were picking on the Palestinians. Then we escaped to Syria and registered as refugees. This is the third time that disaster has befallen us and leaving us homeless. In the West Bank and Gaza, things aren't much better. 
Even though the Palestinian Authority has received 25 times more financial aid per capita than it took to rebuild post-war Europe under the Marshall Plan, today 1.8 million Palestinians live in the Gaza Strip, and 1.5 million of them are registered refugees who take help from the United Nations. 98% of all Palestinians actually live under Palestinian rule, whether in Gaza or in uh, the Palestinian uh, Authority area in the West Bank. They still have refugee camps in the Palestinian-controlled areas as well, which is also something which is unbelievable. All the money that the international community gave to the Palestinians far um, surpasses any uh, contributions, any donations, that any other people received throughout history. This money was not used to solve the Palestinian refugee problems. Unfortunately, it was used to rearm and uh, obtain terror uh, capabilities against Israel. The UN currently has two agencies that deal with refugees. The United Nations Refugee Agency, or UNHCR, deals with refugees from all over the world, while UNRWA handles only the Palestinians. So what's the difference between the two? UNHCR's website states that camp should be the exception and only a temporary measure for refugees. And its stated goals for refugees are voluntary repatriation, resettlement, and integration into the host countries. UNRWA, on the other hand, claims its mandate is merely to contribute to the human development of Palestine refugees until a durable and just solution is found. Everywhere else, refugees lose their status after gaining citizenship from a recognized country. Palestinians, however, can be considered both refugees and citizens. As of 2015, UNHCR had a staff of 9,300 to handle refugees all over the world. While UNRWA had more than 30,000 employees on its payroll just for the Palestinians. To make matters worse, in 1982, UNRWA further extended refugee status to all future generations of displaced Palestinians forever. There is no precedent in history that you can continue the refugee services the second third, and we have here cases of fourth generation as well. So who's picking up the tab for all this? In 2014, the top 10 contributors included Europe, Saudi Arabia, and Japan. And at the very top of the list is the United States, which has contributed a total of $5 billion since UNRWA was founded. UNRWA refugees receive three times more aid than other non-Palestinian refugees around the world. And also, they have one unique criteria which no other refugee in the world shares, and that is they can continue the status of refugees to their descendants. For seven decades, Arab leaders have pushed for a Palestinian right of return to Israel. But what you don't often hear is that the 1948 war created two sets of refugees, one Arab, and one Jewish. In 1917, the British government issued the Balfour Declaration, which promised the Jews a national home in Palestine. The declaration stated that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. But after Israeli independence, all bets were off. Ancient Jewish communities throughout the Middle East were decimated. In Iraq, Zionism became a capital crime, and Jewish property was seized. Egypt, Syria, and Yemen were rocked by anti-Jewish pogroms, and the Syrian government froze Jewish bank accounts. Many of these communities were thousands of years old, and most of them disappeared almost overnight. There were about 850,000 Jewish refugees from Arab countries. Most of them were expelled 
or ran away for their lives to Israel. About uh, 600,000 came here. About 200,000, 250,000 are in other uh, countries. They never had any compensations. They never had any restoration of their rights after their citizenship was stripped away from them. And why don't we hear about their Jewish refugee problem? Because Israel absorbed them from the get-go. They were treated as human beings. They were given citizenship. And today, you don't hear not about their status and not about, of course, their descendants, which are proud Israeli citizens. My father was a refugee from Algeria. He left Algeria penniless. He came here. He participated in the uh, War of uh, Independence. And of course, I'm very proud of him. Throughout the 20th century, tens of millions of refugees around the world have been successfully resettled. So why haven't the Palestinians done the same? Here's how one of UNRWA's own directors, Sir Alexander Galloway, answered that question in 1952. The Arab nations do not want to solve the refugee problem. They want to keep it as an open sore, as an affront to the United Nations, and as a weapon against Israel. Arab leaders do not give a damn whether Arab refugees live or die. What we have seen by successive Palestinian leaders for the last 100 years is that they were shortchanging their own people by not willing to compromise, by looking at the conflict as a zero-sum game, by trying to win it all and destroy Israel, uh, this all-or-nothing approach leaves and will leave them with nothing. And this is what the tragedy is, that the Palestinians have not been able to produce leaders who would be strong enough, who would be courageous enough, who would be wise enough to really seek peace. And that is the history and how we've gotten to this place today. This is in the headlines today. You saw it in the debate, the Republican debate last night. Is there a chance for peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis? Well, if you, if you want to start talking about peace, you have to look at the roots of the conflict. You have to understand what is currently going on, how have we gotten to this position. And I just encourage you, please, get educated on it. Uh, it's one thing for a Christian to say, I support Israel because of the biblical promises. But we need to get educated so our support is effective, uh, that we're able to counter the current arguments coming out of the boycott, divestment, sanction movement, uh, which is talking about our, our, our apartheid states, these kinds of uh, uh, slanderous accusations against Israel. Uh, we need to have the facts. We need to know the history, have the facts, be able to present a defense. If you want this entire series, we've got it for you on DVD. It's called Whose Land Is It? Jewish and Arab Claims to Israel. It will give you the entire history of uh, the conflict, how it came to be, uh, and I encourage you to get it. See the arguments from both sides. We could present the Arab arguments, we present the Jewish arguments, and that extra, what you just saw on the refugee problem. It's yours for a gift of $10, so call us if you'd like it. one 800 759 and then after the show, I'm going to be hosting a Q&A on Facebook, so if you want to ask questions, uh, just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Terry? Fascinating. Every Christian should watch this. Well, still ahead, a seven-year-old is bullied at summer camp. See how a cartoon gives him the courage to stand up for himself and for others to break the cycle of bullying. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A public memorial service will be held Sunday for country music singer Joey Feek. She died last Friday after a two-year battle with cervical cancer. The service will be hosted by Bill and Gloria Gaither, gospel musicians and family friends. The Indianapolis Star reports their service will be held in a high school gym in Feek's hometown of Alexandria, Indiana. Along with her husband, Feek was half of the country music duo, Joey and Rory. A private service will also be held for close family and friends. Her husband wrote on his blog that Joey was now in heaven singing 
for her savior. Operation Blessing has helped people stay warm during the winter in a remote Himalayan village in Nepal, where many residents have not recovered from last year's massive earthquake. Most have little to nothing to protect against severely cold winter temperatures. So Operation Blessing provided residents in the village with warm polar jackets, and the villagers, including babies and young children, receive winter clothing as well. Now they're able to cope against the frigid weather in their mountainous homes. You can learn more about what Operation Blessing is doing by going to its website, ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. The animated series Superbook teaches children the stories of the Bible. It also taught a boy named David how to stand up to bullies. When seven-year-old David went to a day camp last summer, he made lots of new friends. He also met some bullies. There were two bigger kids than me. They punch, they kick. David later told his mom what had happened. We were sad that our son was bullied and had to fight back. We tried to teach him to be kind, but like most kids who get attacked, he was angry and hurt. That's when David's mom, Sess, came across an episode of CBN's Superbook program online. She remembered watching the classic version as a child. They also downloaded the free Superbook mobile app. I like the features of the Superbook app. It has a Bible, games, videos, and pictures of the characters. David especially likes the app and the audio Bible that comes with it. He says it helps him memorize Bible verses. One night, David's mom was thrilled to receive an email from CBN's Superbook team. Dear parent, oh, we have great news for you. While your son David was on the Superbook website, he dedicated his life to Jesus Christ. I was overwhelmed that God spoke to my son's heart through the Superbook app. A few days later, David saw a young girl who was being bullied and stepped in to help. And I told him, Jesus loves you, so he does not want you to fight. And whatever you do to someone, you do to God. The boy apologized to the younger girl and walked away. David says it was the Superbook story about David and Goliath that helped him know what to do. Just like in David in the Bible, I am not afraid from telling them the wrong because God is with me. I am overjoyed that he understood God's love and shared it with another child. The Superbook episode and app helped my son apply Bible lessons to his life. I'm a Superbook kid because I love the Word of God and I love God. If you want to see the children of the world get the stories of the Bible, join the Superbook DVD Club. Uh, your gift will go into the production costs, the translation costs, the distribution costs of the whole series, and, and you have the joy of knowing you're a part of it. You're a part of sending the gospel to the children of the world. And for your gift of $25 or more when you join the club, we'll send you David and Saul, the latest episode in Superbook. Uh, the stories are, are, are just incredible, how uh, young David uh, and his interactions with King Saul and how God allowed him to prevail. Uh, we'll send you not just one copy of it, we're gonna send you three. And then as a special Easter offer, you also get the stories of He is Risen and the Last Supper, all of it. You'll get five DVDs for a gift of $25. So if you wanna do it, call us now, 1-800-759-0700. And if you want the, f the f free episodes, uh, they're free on the app. All you have to do is go to any of the uh, stores, where it's the Apple Store, or the Google Store, or the Kindle Store, and get the app. And the first season, all 13 episodes are absolutely free. Uh, plus, there's a wonderful Bible, games for kids to play. You just saw in the story how that app influenced a young um, boy in the Philippines. You can have your children have the same experience. All you have to do is go and get it and download it, and it's absolutely free. We'll be back with your email questions right after this. Well, it's time to bring it on with some of the email that you've sent in. Gordon, this first one is from Janet, who says, 
Is it wrong not to take communion when it's offered to you? Is it disrespectful to God when you don't feel like you should? Uh, Janet, I would say uh, don't take communion if you don't want to. It, it, these are uh, sacraments. They're, they're, it's the gift of God for the people of God. And if you don't feel like you're right with the Lord, then uh, don't take that. Don't, don't take communion. But I have something for you. Um, keep going to church. And there's a wonderful story that Jesus told uh, about a righteous Pharisee and his prayer, and then an unrighteous tax collector who, who went to the temple, but he stood off at a distance. And his prayer was very simple. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if you pray that, Jesus says, Jesus says, you walk away justified. Uh, so if you don't feel you're, you're right with God and you don't want to take communion, fine, but please pray, pray that prayer. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is from UK, I think is how you pronounce it. Is it possible to lose your anointing? And if so, how do you get it back? Um, you know, this is one of those theological questions that you, you, you sort of puzzle on. I'll give you some scriptures. One is the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. And so the gifts are still active. The calling on your life is still active. But you can lose, and, and David prayed this, prayed this, restore the joy of my salvation. You can lose that joy of the communion uh, with, with Christ. You can keep all of the gifts. You can keep the calling. But you lose your relationship with the one who called you. And, and that separation, you feel it acutely. Um, and I would encourage you, repent, turn. Uh, and you can have that joy restored. Uh, walk through the same steps that David walked through and pray the same prayers and the same God will answer the same prayers. I firmly believe if we do what they did in the Bible, we will get the same result. Well, maybe some of that applies to Charlotte's question because she's saying, I'm a 20-year-old girl and I used to be a Christian, but during the last few years, I've become an atheist. I just stopped believing in God due to things happening in my life. I want to know him again. I keep getting this feeling that it's wrong for me to be an atheist. How can I start believing again and know that he is real? Um, Charlotte, here's the prayer for you, and it's one I encourage people to pray uh, if, if they don't know the Lord. And, and if they're wondering, so whether you're an atheist or an unbeliever or uh, bad things have happened to you in life and you had that question, God, where were you? Uh, you know, why is there injustice in the world? Why is there evil in the world? All of these things. And it's a very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're there, if you're real, if you really are the Savior, the Messiah, if you really came for me, could you show me? Could you show up for me? Now, there's some conditions to this. This isn't something you do casually or flippantly. The Bible says when you seek me with all of your heart, that's when you'll find me. So pray that. Pray that earnestly with all of your heart, and then you'll get your answer. We leave you today with the words of Jesus from John chapter 7. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. God bless you. We'll see you next week.